but yeah, I know it's a really special spot. Um, it's dark out right now. I wish I could show you the view from the balcony. My balcony is like full of geraniums. Oh, wow. Um, can't see a thing because it's nighttime. Will people ask questions in the chat? Um, so, yeah, well, so because it's also being live streamed on YouTube. So on YouTube, they can put stuff in the chat. And then here we have like a little Q&A thing where you can submit questions. And then um, if folks who submit questions are um, up to it, we'll get them to turn on their audio and video and ask you directly. Oh, OK. Or if they're too scared, we'll ask, them, we'll ask for them. Um, are we on YouTube now? Yeah, we are on YouTube. Cool. So should we just start introducing and then let people filter in? Yeah, sure, let's do that. Cool. Um, all right. Um, hello and welcome to Lockdown Film School, our weekly series of discussions with filmmakers in various fields. I'm Alex Heaney, the editor-in-chief of Seventh Row, and my co-host today is our executive editor, Orla Smith. Say hi, Orla. Hello. <laughs> um, so this week we're delighted to be joined by two really amazing Toronto filmmakers. So we have Kajik Radvinsky and Sofia Bogdanovich. Um, so if, pardon? Got it. Oh, great. <laughs> um, so Orla is going to facilitate this discussion um, between Sophia and Kaz for about 40 minutes. And then we will turn the tables over to you, our viewing audience on both Zoom and YouTube for an audience Q&A. Um, so there are several ways you can ask questions. So listen carefully. If you're on YouTube, just type your question into the live comments feed at any point in the session and we'll get to them at the end. If you're on Zoom, you can type your question in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, if you're on Zoom, please let us know if you'd rather we ask the question on your behalf. Um, otherwise, we'll invite you to use your video and mic to ask your question in person. Um, so before we get started, I'll quickly introduce both of our guests. So Sophia is a filmmaker. Well, we were so we had written that you are a filmmaker based in Toronto, but you're currently in Paris, um, who works primarily in documentary and meta nonfiction. And in 2016, Sophia won the Emerging Canadian Director Award for her feature debut, the micro budget fiction Never Eat Alone, starring Durag Campbell. Um, her last poems trilogy, a series of shorts about the life and death of her grandmother were presented in a masterclass at Montreal's Festival de Nouveau Cinéma in 2017. And in 2018, the Toronto Critics Association awarded her the J. Scott Prize, um, an annual film award presented to an emerging talent in the Canadian film industry. Her latest feature, MS Slavic 7, which she co-directed with Campbell, premiered at the Berlin Film Festival last year and was recently released online by movie. Um, Kaz is a filmmaker based in Toronto. He has a unique method of making fiction features that is more akin to a documentary shoot, wherein he gathers his cast and crew once a week over a year or two to shoot both scripted and improvised footage. He made his first two features, Tower and How Heavy This Hammer, with non-professional actors. Both films garnered acclaim and screened at festivals such as TIFF and the Berlin Alley. Uh, his latest, And at 13,000 Feet, premiered in the platform competition at TIFF, where it was awarded an honorable mention. And it was later nominated for four Canadian Screen Awards, including Best Motion Picture. Uh, Kaz has also co-founded the film production and distribution company, MDFF. So welcome. We're really excited to have you guys both here. And I'll turn it over to you, Orla. Cool. Um, <laughs> well, I tend to start these things by asking just generally, could you tell me a bit about your journey to becoming filmmakers and how you sort of worked out? that this is what you wanted to do and this is how you wanted to tell stories. Uh, who wants to go first? Huh? <laughs> you can go, Cass. Um, I, I, I watched a lot of movies uh, in my adolescence. I, I was, uh, I would say when I was 14 or 15, I was pretty, I was a bad student and a little depressed and kind of withdrew, but just started watching three or four movies a day, started working, at an independent video store that specialized in foreign films and uh, classic films and just 
kept watching films until it felt like there was a dialogue or something. I wanted to do something with that um, knowledge base or, uh, and, um, and then from there I decided to go to film school and um, yeah, it, it was like a, a long journey. I think it took me a while to get the confidence to want to be a filmmaker. Initially I thought I'd be a cinematographer um, so yeah, I was just, you know, slowly by being around other filmmakers or film students, I, I slowly got the confidence to start writing and directing my own shorts. I started with documentary. Um, that's where I first found my footing, you know, third or fourth year of film school. And then there is something in documentary or working with capturing certain types of moments. There's a certain sort of documentary texture that I think again, this idea of confidence or something, it was almost like trusting those moments uh, and wanting to share those moments made me feel like I could make something that other people might, might want to see. Mm. Um, for me, it was a very interesting, I think, entry point because uh, I was not a very confident teenager and I had a really hard time with public speaking um, so in high school, I would do presentations sometimes and I would just bomb, like I just had like no control out of the live output. And I started thinking about mediums where you had control of live output. So after having bombed a couple of presentations um, and just hating public speaking, I kind of realized that I could use my dad's JVC camcorder to like make a film instead of doing like a, your typical Bristol board presentation. So I just started filming things with his JVC camcorder and became like obsessed with tape to tape editing. So I would like shoot things on his JVC camcorder. I would hook it up to the VCR and press like record like with the remote control. And then I figured out like if I popped like the left uh, audio like XLR cable like into my Discman, then I could get like music in one channel and like dialogue <laughs> in the other. I was like a very, very uh, nerdy kid. Um, and it, it really started from there. It was, it was, I guess, born out of this obsession with, I guess, kind of like controlling how I was presenting myself to the world um, and wanting to be able to manipulate that, but then also having fun in the process. And I remember we had this ComTech course in high school and I kind of realized that it might be an option um, to be a, a filmmaker, but a lot of people said, you know, it's more of a hobby. It's not really like a thing you can make money from. Uh, I applied to York University to do my undergrad. I did not get in. So I went to the UK to find myself for a year on a gap year. And then I ended up going to um, a technical college. So I went to the Toronto Film School to get um, my diploma there. And then from there, I think what really fascinated me was my um, great grandmother's poetry and my um, great grandmother wrote a lot of really interesting uh, poetry about her experience in Toronto. And I find myself identifying with um, her words. So I guess like my starting point was really trying, I guess, to uh, bring life to her words through um, a visual medium. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned like control, because actually I think one thing that um, sort of your working methods from my perspective seem to share is this idea of like embracing the unknown in your filmmaking by like going into an environment without like with some sort of like idea of a structure but without an exact game plan of how you're going to shoot it um, and like an openness to improvisation for example um, how did uh, you both realize that that was kind of an approach that worked for you versus a more like exactly structured and planned to shoot? Mm. Well, for me, yeah, I, I think early sort of breakthroughs were with documentary and sort of experiencing sort of performances and sort of becoming, trying to find things that would be fascinating to record. And this feeling which I think extends into other parts of filmmaking, but through performance or through the subject, finding something that kind of goes beyond your initial ideas or kind of grows organically. And I feel like film in general sort of like that with other collaborations with the, the DP or the editor or 
producer that it's sort of this collaborative thing um, that can keep growing, which I think has always helped me too. Um, this, uh, so it, that sort of creative spirit um, and always sort of having that on set and being sort of open. I think that's, that's firmly, so always in the back of my head that this, you know, could be, this will be a richer experience than what I could conceive, you know, sitting down at a computer typing, that it's sort of interacting with real things and um, yeah, uh, embracing things like improvisation or reacting to locations, um, real locations, learning how to work in certain environments um, has always been uh, yeah, a key source of inspiration. Yeah, and I think it's similar for me and I kind of learned that I like to work in an improvisatory and spontaneous way through, I think like bombing shoots, which were like extraordinarily like planned and mm -hmm. storyboarded. Like my first like fiction film that I made in film school. And I guess like my first fiction fiction film in my portfolio, um, I just found to be really stagnant, stale, contrived. Um, and I think films, um, you know, just as Kaz was saying, you know, reacting to locations, reacting to objects that you find, reaction, reacting to room tone that you might find in a space that's interesting and chasing after it and going um, to go record it. Those are all things that are really interesting in terms of like making a film, I think, a living and breathing organism. That's what makes it um, very um, exciting and engaging, I think for an audience um, to watch. And for me, I started to make, I guess like more docu-fiction or I guess more documentary leaning work that was more staged with my Polish grandmother in her home. And it was documentary, but I had more of a staged um, aesthetic and it was also a very comfortable place for me to um, explore. And I think through those kinds of experiments, I kind of learned that um, if you look at filmmaking as a process and looking at catastrophes that come in your way, um, that like perceived catastrophes or bad things that might happen and kind of look at them as gifts and seeing how you can incorporate them into your film um, can actually be more interesting than not. I remember Kaz doing actually a Q&A with Denis Cote um, for his screening series many years ago. And Denis Cote said, you know, like, if I'm going to do like a documentary about like, you know, fishermen, I'm not going to like learn how to be a fisherman because if I like know this trade in and out, then my film isn't going to be very engaging. It's going to be stale um, and stagnant and filmmaking is a process of discovery. And for me, that's very much how I've learned to come and see it, but it's taken a while. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess conversely also, despite the fact that you're both like excited by the idea of, of the unknown in your shoots, I gather you both sort of write scripts of some form for your fiction films, even if they're just a loose guideline. So I'm wondering what you feel you get out of the process of screenwriting and having a script, even if you know you're not necessarily going to like follow what's on the page. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, um, I feel like it's the first, I feel like every, like filmmaking is a series of drafts or edits. So I feel like the script is the first improvisation or what would sort of be the first, you know, and that's when I, I used to hate screenwriting, but when I would start writing more and more and just imagining a scene, yeah, it, it sort of comes to life and it sort of takes turns um, that you wouldn't expect or by sort of, yeah, the process of writing it, uh, it helps. Um, and I would say too, like, um, I guess this crossed my mind a few times when Sophia was thinking that, I, the other thing I relate to with Sophia um, is, you know, her, her using her grandmother as inspiration or, or certain things like that. That I, I do that a lot in my own work, too, in terms of locations I choose or sort of using um, incorporating lived experience into scripts or into ideas and sort of writing for locations I know. So sort of choosing a location I've been to many times and just sort of imagining interactions there or or just sort of knowing what the light will be like at a certain time of day or what it'll sound like, all those things I'm, I'm thinking about when I write and sort of building uh, an arena or, or, or something or world to explore when we actually get to shoot there. But it's sort of make, ensuring that there's enough sort of elements and um, enough conflict uh, to sort of drive a scene. Yeah, and um, yeah, I suppose for me in terms of 
writing screenplays. I'm actually writing my first one right now. I've actually never written like a fully fleshed out script um, for any of my work. Uh, never Eat Alone started off as a documentary shoot, my first feature film. Um, and I just accumulated a lot of footage of my grandmother and then kind of pieced the narrative together in the edit. Um, and then realized that I needed like a narrative vehicle and a narrative device to string all this documentary footage together. And that's um, when I started working with um, the Canadian actor, Derek Campbell, um, to play this kind of like avatar or uh, version of myself in this film playing uh, my grandmother's uh, granddaughter. And um, for a lot of those scenes, what we did um, is we would have like beats. So we would say like, okay, the scene needs to start here and it needs to end here. This is maybe what has to happen midpoint. This is necessary information. So there wasn't a script, but there were goals per se. Um, and then in my third feature film that I co-directed with Dara MS Slavic 7, we had like an outline for the film. Um, Dara pitched me an outline. So kind of just like an idea of um, how the film should be put together. And she's a really good architect in terms of her thoughts and how things should be structured. And then from there, we were writing scenes together, but some bits of it were improvised. But now we're moving into a phase where this thing um, is fully scripted but it's actually based on a lot of conversations that we've had together, um, lived experiences, Kaz um, said, and also based on interviews that we've had um, with people on this subject matter um, that we're exploring. So it's been a process for me to, I guess, get to a place where I'm working, I guess, more formally. Mm, yeah. I mean, um... Speaking of working with actors, uh, I did hear Dara Campbell say, describe sort of what she called a, a non-hierarchical model between the actor and the director with you, Sophia, even before you were co-directors. And that also kind of fits with what you told me last year, Kaz, about Anne at 13,000 feet being like a process of creating the character with the actor in collaboration. So I kind of want to ask you about your guys' approach to directing actors and to what extent you like to involve them sort of in your personal creative process of developing the film? Yeah, uh, so much of it is is sort of based on the performance or, or the character and uh, almost trying to learn from the character or uh, create, preserve a tone or an atmosphere or a headspace that uh, it's almost like the idea, the ideal is to get to a point where we don't have to talk about it anymore. And we can just kind of be with the character. We just kind of, there'll be a, a setup or something and then we can just start doing. And um, yeah, so that's always really great. And it would be like that with the earlier films too. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, the first two features were sort of non-professional actors. I think I'd almost prefer to say non-union or mm -hmm. Um, cause yeah, they, they were very much, you know, like there was a, a lot of commitment on their part. Like they wanted to, they were chasing a performance in the same way I was, or they were, um, wanted to grow a character with me and working with Dara. And then I guess also Matt as well. Um, I don't know if it, the word professional still doesn't seem right. I mean, it, uh, they're also filmmakers, um, mm. and it's more just, we're, we're all collaborators, um. So it's sort of, yeah, I, I still don't know if I've worked with professional actors or that sort of uh, where you come on set and you do your job and it's sort of based off of the script. It's always an, an evolving thing where I guess I work with everyone slightly differently because there isn't a, a set method, but it really is uh, out of, you know, mutual respect and um, trying to find and, and sort of you know, it's such a long process too, and sort of go through this process together and sort of understand and get to a really interesting place with the film and with, with the characters. Yeah, I think um, with Dara and I, and I think it like very much um, runs in tandem with um, the way that David Lynch works. Um, and he often talks about how it's like about serving the idea 
So it's not about like you against the actors or your crew. It's about you working in tandem, like with other people with this situation and you're serving the idea. So every decision that you're making is serving like the film um, as a greater whole. And I think that's a really important thing to consider um, when you're making a film because it kind of like removes ego and this like idea of like power and control. Um, because if it's you and your collaborators that you're working with versus the situation versus the idea and, um, you know, really, really striving to make that the best that it can be, then it's more of a conversation and less, um, I think, of a conflict. And Dara and I have, I think, like a very open relationship in which we're really able to experiment together, like say like, this doesn't look good, this doesn't feel right, let's try it again. Um, and again, it's all about what the essence of the film is. So really determining that ahead of time and kind of like making sure that everything is like moving in that direction. And I kind of, I, I totally hear what you're saying, Kaz, about like professionals or like, I guess like that like name tag because, um, yeah, like I work with Dara, who's very much a professional in terms of the way that she approaches the work um, as an artist, but it's been, you know, mostly Dara and family members that I've worked with and with Maison du Bonheur, um, with Julianne, um, and that film was a, a documentary. Um, it was all about, I guess, like collaborating and finding the best way, I think, to tell um, her story. So my approach was collaborative in that um, I spoke to her about like, how do you want to tell your story? How do you want to explain these facets um, of your life? And I think it's similar with Dara and this character, Audrey Benak, that we've developed together. Uh, we're constantly talking about, you know, like, how do we want to add, you know, a new dimension to this character? Um, you know, um, how do we want to, I guess, like develop her interactions um, with certain facets of my family history that she kind of moves through in different um, films. So yeah, it comes from a place, I think, of um, genuine um, curiosity. Um, and I think that, yeah, when I'm, when I'm working, I like the approach to be um, collaborative because um, things that I'm seeing in front of me um, are much more enhanced, I think, with the opinions and input from other people. Mm, yeah, I mean, to talk about the broader crew as well, um, I suppose you go on set for a shooting day without a uh, strictly lit up plan as you guys do you must really have to kind of trust your crew to be on it and be responding to the actors in the environment um in a way that kind of syncs up with your vision and what you're trying to do so um I guess what do you look for in a team of collaborators and how have you gone about finding the people that you want to work with who you have worked with well I'd say broadly speaking uh, a sort of um creative or artistic interest from them that, you know, and that comes from, I guess, the earlier films where we, we didn't have a budget and we were just uh, making films uh, just to be able to, I mean, to not lose money and make a film was sort of the goal um, initially. So it only felt right that to work with people that were um, getting the same amount of creative fulfillment as I was, or that just seemed like the initial ingredient is that everybody, be it the actors or the cinematographer or the editor, that uh, it started feeling wrong when there were people there um, with sort of more minor crew roles. So I've always, I always feel more comfortable with a very small crew and everybody is sort of an essential collaborator. Uh, beyond that, um, I suppose I work with a lot of the same people um, and it's kind of hard to describe, but, but I think a lot of them are sort of irreplaceable or it's mm -hmm. hard to imagine working with different people. Um, Nikolai, for instance, who's a cinematographer, uh, and at 13,000 feet and hammer and cutaway and scaffold. Um, yeah, he goes far, far and beyond. I mean, like he is sort of, uh, an incredible cinematographer working with practical lights and making adjustments. I trust him totally uh, as camera movements, everything like that. And then beyond that, just sort of his, uh, Dara a few times talked about it beautifully during Q and A's, but they had such a special relationship, you know, when the camera's that close to her, 
sort of so much of what Nikolai's doing is sort of adjusting to her. And in some ways it's to capture performance moments like that, but then also just sort of establish a trust between Dara and the camera and just sort of preserve, uh, preserving the atmosphere on set. I mean, I'm doing that, but I think Nikolai is also doing that quite a bit too. Um, and then Isla, who, who has cut everything I've done, uh, we were film students together. So Isla's cut everything I've done since 2007. Um, mm. okay, so it's like we learned uh, how to make films together. And um, I, I trust her so much. And when she makes her own films, it's exper they're, they're more experimental. So she's so great at sort of um, rhythm and juxtapositions and timing and sort of detail. Um, so... Yeah, it's so great to see her sort of finesse and work with the footage and sort of take it, uh, yeah, further. Um, mm -hmm. But I can keep going, but yeah, I'm curious about what <laughs> Sophia has to say. You are a great curator of collaborators. You have such great people working on your um, films. Um, when you're talking about Nikolai, I was thinking about him holding Dara's hand before she jumped out of the airplane on Anne um, and that he was like, holding the camera, but also holding her hand. And remember thinking that yes. was touching. Um, but yeah, I guess for me moving into filmmaking, I was really inspired by uh, my producer, Calvin Thomas and his co-director, Yona Lewis, when they first made their micro budget first film, Amy George, and they did everything themselves. Like Calvin shot the film, they colored it on their own. They uh, funded it with PayPal before like, Kickstarter like was a thing. Um, and I was also really inspired by what um, Dan and Cass were doing and um, Antoine Bourges as well. I remember that Dan uh, Montgomery, Cass's producer, lent me like my first um, ME66 Sennheiser shotgun microphone um, so that I could um, shoot my first feature film, which was greatly appreciated. But I was really inspired by uh, my friends who were making films and learning how to be technically proficient, because if you're technically proficient, it makes you more independent and you can save more money. And I didn't really have a lot of money when I was making my first um, feature film. Calvin and I um, shot it together on a mini DV um, camcorder. Um, and because I haven't had a lot of money um, for crew, I've kind of learned how to um, shoot things on my own. Um, in terms of um, collaboration, I think there are more collaborators that come in in post. So usually um, on set, like it's me doing camera and then audio. Some of the time, sometimes I'll have um, uh, a couple of production assistants assisting or Calvin will help um, with sound, but it's really like a very, very small micro um, crew. Um, and it lends to a very intimate environment. And I think that that kind of vibe seeps into the final product. You kind of sometimes in my filmmaking, I feel like you're seeing things that you shouldn't really see because it's that fresh and it's that intimate. But in terms of, um, I guess, collaboration and post-production, like I've worked a lot with Matt Chan, who's a really great uh, mixer in Toronto, and Alma Bello and Lucas Prokasiak, who's also a really great um, mixer and um, filmmaker, Jacqueline Mills, um, has also done a lot of my um, sound design. And for me, it's, it's more about aligning myself, I think, with people who, I guess, have the same... Um, vision and are as excited and as curious in the project um, as I am. They don't necessarily have to like um, love me, but they have to love the work. I think that's really, really important. So I always want to work with people who really love what they do. And I think it's not always exactly about technical proficiency, like Kieślowski um, once said that whenever he met with crew members, it wasn't about like how much they knew, but like how they get along. And for me, because I keep things so small and because I do a lot of, um, I guess, the tasks in terms of making a film when I do bring people in, it's really, really important for us to have good chemistry and for us to be able to have good conversations about, um, I guess, what we want the film to be. Mm. I mean, um, I guess like jumping off something you said earlier, I was curious because you're both, well, your filmmakers based in Toronto most of the time, um, who often make films in the city. Uh, 
Thanks. Could you tell me a bit about sort of like the filmmaking community in Toronto, which you're both kind of a part of, and how that's shaped your progression as filmmakers? Yeah, it's, uh, I feel like it's grown a lot in the past decade. Um, um, there's now, yeah, so many people, uh, just people we've mentioned, I suppose, Antoine Bourges and um, Calvin and Yona. Um, there's so many people now, there feels like a real community. Um, so yeah, practically, it's great to have those sort of resources or um, sharing crew or giving feedback on rough cuts or giving advice on funding or so many little small things, uh, helping people connect and things like that. Um, I, I met uh, both Dara and Matt through those sort of channels. Um, so yeah, a lot of the time it's at a movie theater. Um, I think that was part of the mandate of MDFFF is that we just want to keep encouraging that and sort of, um, you know, a monthly place for people to go and watch films together and hopefully uh, form friendships and relationships uh, that sometimes lead to, to films getting made. But yeah, it's, I feel like in the past decade, uh, it's changed quite a bit. I remember when I was first making Tower or my, my early work, uh, there were a few filmmakers I looked up to, um, Denny Cote, which uh, Sophie already mentioned, and um, uh, Nicholas Pareda. Uh, there's a, quite a, there were quite a few um, filmmakers who came to Toronto to study, uh, but then would make their films abroad. Uh, so, so Nico would make his films in Mexico, um, and um, who else? Igor, Igor Deriacha, and um, Luli. Um, all uh, sort of filmmakers, and I think they all made a feature before me, but they made it in, they made it not in Toronto, they made it in um, another country. So that, I was definitely um, aware of that and just felt like something was gonna start happening in Toronto and that there was enough sort of brewing. Yeah, I think the space, I think that MDFF has provided, I think on the monthly, I think for people to congregate has been, I think integral, I think, to the growth of the Toronto film community. But I think that like um, people are just really, I think like open and warm um, and generous just in terms, I think of like sharing resources or just like sharing grant applications or, you know, brainstorming in terms of how to get funding um, uh, for something. I think that it's, we all have like, you know, some people talk about like, oh, it's the Toronto new wave. And is there something definitive that's coming out of it? And I think that we all have our own, I think, like individual way of, I think, like making films. Um, we all have a very like individual aesthetic, but I don't think we're individualistic. I think in our pursuits, it's not a very um, competitive environment. I always feel very... Um, encouraged and um you know we like to collaborate on each other's projects i just watched um a rough cut of lena rodriguez's um new documentary that she's in the process of making um and i was the sound recordist um on the film which is something i never thought i would do but because i've been working in this community for years with people who are like you can learn you know how to do your own sound you can learn how to do your own camera um working through being i guess like encouraged you know by people like Kaz and learning like that I can be self-sufficient you know I've grown into you know moving into this role where I'm doing like sound recording on someone else's um, film so I really kind of like love um, that uh, fluidity and I think um, the sharing of resources and space um, and the support I think it's I think it's really integral for me um, it's kind of like a lifeblood that kind of keeps me going because filmmaking is a very, it can be a very isolating process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, totally. And it, it's helpful to know that I have, you know, like friends like Kaz, whenever like I'm in like a very difficult position, I can be like, what do you think of this? And he'll be like, oh, that's not actually a really big deal. So I actually feel um, quite grateful that Toronto film community is a warm place. Yeah, just to echo or build on what Sophia is saying. Yeah, I think she really, there's something, you know, it's difficult to write a film or it's difficult to fund a film, especially if you're doing it alone or even just to edit a film or to submit it to festivals. So having that feeling of community or so much of it is just sort of, is 
some of these processes are so long or I just, I was lucky just with my first short films that I had a small community of just like Dan and a few people, but you know, you have to submit to 50 or a hundred fe festivals, the amount of rejection letters you get or yeah, how long different. it take to finish a cut, you know, and just have people to kind of spur you on or to show different versions to. Cause I think that's what's sort of new about in Toronto is a lot of these productions are very small and autonomous and a lot of sort of, you know, people working independently or with a small group of friends um, that there isn't that as much of a structure or support system to sort of carry projects to fruition or ensure that they get, they find an audience. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess for the uninitiated in the audience, could you explain a bit about how MDFF started and how the screenings work? Sure. Sure. Yeah. It started um, after my first feature tower uh, that basically Dan and I, um, we're traveling around um, different festivals with Tower and meeting filmmakers who made these incredible films that were screening in New York and they were screening in Berlin, but they weren't screening in Toronto. And I suppose it was Tower was my first feature, which also made me aware too of just how many, um, and also just the situation of cinemas and how many hoops you have to jump through to screen in certain cities or to get, you know, certain sort of screening opportunities that very rarely um, were these, you know, these films that seemed vital uh, for people in Toronto to see. It was almost this feeling that we wanted Toronto for, you know, it just felt important that Toronto got to see sort of emerging filmmakers from around the world. Um, and that we wanted like our friends and our peers and people to sort of see these exciting new things that for Toronto to be uh, a cinematic city that we needed, you know, we wanted the same or the same films that New York uh, were getting. So yeah, it started very small uh, in Kensington Market um, uh, in an art space called Double Double Land. Um, we would uh, uh, buy projectors from Best Buy and Future Shop and then <laughs> two screenings and then return them. And then we, it was very, uh, we were very resourceful back then. Um, so that was, that was back in 2013. But yeah, it quickly became a monthly thing and Filmmakers would always want to come up, like they really wanted to screen in Toronto. The first screening we did uh, was a film by Dan Salit, and he uh, he flew up and did a Q and A with us uh, in Double Double Land. So we just kind of kept kept on with it, and now yeah, we're at TIFF, um, the Lightbox, once a month. Um, that yeah, I guess it was a really a momentary thing, but it, we just sort of uh, kept doing it, and um, yeah, it. Uh, mm. uh, it was amazing to see how it grew. Um, and I always remember feeling really hungry during those screenings because in Double Double Land, um, Double Double Land, sorry, was on top of a bakery. So you would always like smell this, like the scent of like fresh bread, like rising through this room. Um, it was kind of, it was kind of amazing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm curious, like amongst that kind of community you formed in Toronto, um, when you're in the editing process for a film, uh, are you often sort of like showing cuts to each other or do you have sort of like broader test screenings when you're making a film or do you prefer to kind of keep it within filmmakers that you know? Um, I never do too large of a test screening, um, but I do try to open up to people I sort of partially know. Um, or we did that a bit more with Anne. But yeah, there's definitely like a key group of people I show the earlier cuts to. A lot of it's digital, a lot of it's filmmakers around the world, but then also, yeah, so Sophia saw an early cut of Anne at 13,000 feet, um, before it was called Anne at 13,000 feet. Um, what was it called originally? <laughs> I'd rather not say. It worked in title for a while. Yeah, it took us a, a while to arrive on that title. Um, but that came out of conversations. Um, so the title for I know 13,000 feet came after these sort of test screenings and sort of talking things through. I remember sort of trying out different titles and different responses. Um, so yeah, it's a, again, with my work in particular, it's a very long editing process. Uh, so yeah, getting uh, perspective on cuts by showing it to people, yeah, has always been very crucial. I'm trying to think though, I don't know if we did it's in the back of my head sometimes to do a broader test screening, um, but I don't know if we, we've ever been able to coordinate that, um, mm -hmm. like an audience of 50 or so. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm sensitive about doing like 
larger test screenings. Like we, we tried it for MS Lavic seven, um, but they were still all people that we knew. Like I definitely have like a group of like um, tried and tested viewers and reviewers who will, you know, a group of like four people. It's really small actually, we'll watch it. Um, and we grew it a little bit more for MS Lavic seven. And we got to the point where there's just like so much feedback and it was all really interesting and it was all really good, but it actually got to the point that it was kind of confusing. You know, I think that, um, for me, when I edit, because all the films that I've made to date, um, they didn't really have a screenplay. So there wasn't like a set plan. It was about finding that narrative in the edit. And, you know, certainly in MS Slavic seven, that was Dara and I goofing around in the editing suite for about six months trying to like hash out a story for this film. Um, and uh, I like that process of discovery coming from a place where I was afraid of discovery and improvisation and making mistakes. I came to a place I think with myself and in my practice to incorporate improvisation and spontaneity um, and kind of harness it through the editing process. And I think for me, it's important to have collaborators who know my work and who know the context of what I've made to give me feedback. But in my last experience, I was just like a little bit sensitive in terms of like, okay, I have all this feedback. What do I incorporate? Um, what don't I? And I think it's also about um, knowing yourself and how um, sensitive you are to, I guess, like the ideas and knowing for yourself if you can kind of like sort it and organize it. But I also think that time is the guy. Time is so important when you're editing a film. Just like stepping away for like a week or two can do your mind a world of good. So I think that um, when you're doing those review and test screenings, it's good to kind of like give yourself like a week, you know, or two just to kind of like think about what people have said and to like get over the fact that your first, you know, rough cut isn't a masterpiece. <laughs> Mm, so have you, have you um, edited all your films yourself? I have. Right. Well, so Kaz, you have an editor, or as you've edited your films yourself. Um, I guess, um, what do you both get out of both different ways of doing that? Why do you prefer to kind of have a second voice and why do you prefer to edit yourself? Um, for me, I kind of self-destruct if I edit on my own I just end up reading, <laughs> like doing the same cut again and again that I really it's it's I'm like that with a lot of things uh that I really uh rely on a conversation or somebody else interacting with me or I kind of can only you know I end up putting too much energy on one thing and lose um uh perspective of the bigger picture uh, so that's, I think what I get from editing is sort of being able to take a step back and sort of, uh, sort of what Sophia was saying, time is really important too. And sort of, I mean, I find it really exciting to have somebody work on, um, something and then, and then, and then, and then look at it again, something that I worked on very closely and then somebody else do it. There, there are times where I will cut things myself, uh, especially with some of my short films, Cutaway and Scaffold. Um, but, uh. Yeah, it's uh, again, and at 13,000 feet, we experimented a lot more. Um, we made some, you know, the, the opening scene of uh, and at 13,000 feet in particular that, I mean, was it wasn't like that in the script. Um, these sort of juxtapositions and sort of intercutting between these scenarios was something that came out of conversations. And, um, you know, as we watched the film, as we saw people react to it, you know, in the headspace that felt more right for the film, I kept sort of adjusting it. And um, so, yeah, it really grew, really grew um, from that collaboration. Um, yeah, for me, I like to edit on my own because I guess it comes out of like a place of, you um, necessity but also I just like I love to edit I've always loved to edit when I was in high school I used to hide under the table of the editing suite in the comm tech room because my comm tech teacher thought that I was like hogging the computer too much which I was but I just like wanted more time to experiment with it so I would hide under the table until he left which 
was about like maybe like a half an hour, 20 minutes, and then he would leave and I would continue to kind of like edit and, and work on my own projects. Um, and um, I remember the janitors of my high school would often like come in and like visit with me to like check out what I was doing. And it came out of a place of like pure, I think like pleasure because I just like, it's something that I love to experiment with. And I love seeing um, how footage uh, comes together. It's the most, I think, exciting and satisfying process after you've like bled all over yourself um, during a, a production. It's, it's really exciting to see that come to life. But I had a really interesting experience with MS Slavic 7 in that um, when Darren and I came to the editing table um, and I did actually rather like when I first started editing it, it was just me and I was looking at this film and I was like, I don't know what this is. And it scared me. And for the first time when I was editing something, I didn't have all of the answers. I edited the first 20 minutes of the film and I was having a little bit of a freak out because I was like, oh, I feel like we wasted a lot of time. Um, and money, this is not coming together. I don't know what the voice of the film is. And Dara watched it and she was like, actually, you know what, calm down. There's something here. It's actually kind of funny. I think we can work with this. And she offered actually to come in um, two days a week to edit with me. So that was like my first time really collaborating and bringing someone in um, to the editing room with me because previous to that, I was doing a lot of rough cuts sharing them a lot with Calvin Thomas, um, my producer and collaborating um, with him from there, but he wasn't sitting with me, you know, in the editing suite for those um, long hours. Um, and another reason why I do it um, myself, and I guess it's like more like financially related is that I can pay myself um, mm -hmm. to do it as well. Like the reason why I think I've been able to kind of stretch this far and kind of like develop my technical skills, but also support myself as a filmmaker is to learn how to do these things um, so that I can pay myself to do it so that I can um, survive. But I, that has come, um, that has brought me so far and that's been really great. Um, but I think on future projects, um, especially on the feature that I'm working right now, I might actually be looking to work um, with an editor. So I think, um, more I think collaboration is on the horizon for me mm. cool um well I'm gonna turn it over to Alex now for some audience questions okay so um the first question is you guys have talked a bit about working with sort of low budgets and um so what advice do you have for filmmakers looking to be more independent and work that way what are sort of the lessons learned that you wish you knew before um I would say one thing I, I, I keep coming back to or is, yeah, especially even as I, I get um, higher budgets, it's, there's still sort of certain things I try to maintain. Uh, one thing which I think has been a real blessing or sort of key sort of um, production strategy is that we've o I've always had complete access to a camera. Mm -hmm. um, my, my earlier films, the DOP owned it. And then um, with Hammer, we, we were able to purchase a camera and we used that camera again on Anna at 13,000 feet. Um, so that has been, you know, it, that, the camera we use now is six years old. Um, so even as I'm trying to strategize for the next feature, we're thinking, you know, it's such, it can be such um, very quickly, um, you can get all your money tied up in rentals or, and then all that really, it just spirals out of control so easily. And that's something I still have to constantly bring the reins back in and be like, what, what is going to make this film successful? Um, and that is sort of that sort of freedom to be able to sort of follow the film. I mean, it's very specific to me and my process uh, being, you know, just that I want to shoot for a certain length of time and want to have that freedom and the types of days I want to shoot. But yeah, I think that has been a huge, um, a huge thing. Um, and it extends to all the other sort of aspects, even editing is sort of creating, uh, you know, the right sort of workflow that for, for the long term. Um, 
on a on an editing system that we can sort of work on at an editing suite, but also work on at home. Um, I'm trying to think of even just with locations that we can return to a location. We're very careful not to burn locations because we might want to go back. <laughs> and then of course that extends to um, you know collaborators, you know, and, and casting people that are again. I, I think that's the first thing I said is that it's looking for people with that artistic interest that will want to keep working on it because that's been sort of the key thing. Because I think when you work low budget, it's sort of unique to your production. Um, that if you're making a film under two hundred thousand dollars, that it's there's a, a million ways to do it. And it's so much of it is what's right for you and the people you're working with and um, making sure that those collaborations and that the, the workspace and everything feels right. And everyone is sort of set up to be able to sort of work at their full potential and sort of be creative and sort of collaborate to their best ability. I sometimes kind of think of myself as like a little raccoon in an alleyway, just trying to like scavenge what I can find <laughs> when I'm making a film. And I think it's just about like using the variables that you have on hand, you know? And that's what gives this human imprint to your film, which is really um, exciting. So it's about looking at what's around you um, and trying to incorporate it into um, your filmmaking process and learning how to render it interesting and exciting, I think, for an audience. And I think if you don't have a lot of money, look around you um, and see what you have and see if you, like how you can employ it to make a film. So for me, um, my first point of inspiration was my great grandmother's poetry. And I used my grandmother's home as like my first uh, location. Um, and I think that by, I think looking at what I had and what I had to work with, it gave me the space, I think, to learn how to be technically proficient. And again, like I need to underline that. I think it's really, really important. Um, even if you're going to be a director that isn't, you know, manipulating the camera or editing, it's good for you to be able to do it so that you can, when you're working with a bigger crew, you can empathize with those crew members, but you can also like, uh, know exactly what to ask for. You know what you're looking for um, uh, because you've executed, you've executed it and you've done it before um, yourself. Um, I think that that is really, really, really um, important. Um, other ways that I've, I think like learned how to, I think like make things on the fly or to do things um, cheaply, and I don't recommend this to everyone, but um, I pulled out a line of credit for myself. Um, so sometimes whenever, like if I have an idea and I want to um, shoot spontaneously, um, then I have the flexibility um, to use that for the production. Um, and then what I'll do is when I'm moving into post-production, is I'll apply for post-production funding and I'll use my fee as an editor to pay myself back for the production. So it's about, I, I think like being thrifty and finding loopholes. And I only recommend that as a way of shooting because it's a way that I shot my second documentary, Maison du Bonheur. And I didn't have funding right away to shoot that film, but I knew that it was gonna be a really interesting documentary. Um, and that I had to shoot it in about a month and I didn't have 10 grand. Um, so I took a little bit of a risk and I took out this line of credit um, and it worked for me to have that kind of pressure, but I used um, Arts Council funding and because of my skills as an editor and learning how to foley my own film um, and sound edit it as well, I was able to save on those costs and pay myself back um, for the production budget. So learning all of those technical skills can really save you a lot of money in the end. Yeah, it's, it's so relative too. it's so unique to each production and each person's situation. Um, it's, you know, there's the micro budget fund in Canada now through telefilm, which is 125,000. And uh, I made my first feature for 50. I don't like, but at the same time, you know, 50, to a lot of people is nothing, 125,000 to a lot of people is nothing, but it's also a lot of money too. So it's so, it can, but it can disappear um, very quickly if you invest in certain things or have a, a different model, which might work for some people, but not for other people. But it's a very, 
kind of hard thing to talk about. I, th I think the number one thing is really, I think another thing that I really benefited from, and I'm assuming Sophia did as well, is that we both made a lot of short films before we made a feature and sort of trusted or sort of, um, it was a really good way to sort of learn our comfort zones in filmmaking before taking a leap to a feature and a, a larger amount of money. Yeah, like doing, I think, like sketches to develop, I think like a voice and style, which is something I think that you did really well. Kaz, I think is really, really helpful in kind of understanding, um, I guess, how that factors into um, a feature film at large. And I think, sorry, the last thing I will say about budgeting is um, just like be really friendly with people um, when I guess like you're negotiating things, I guess, like in terms of like locations or, you know, processing your film in a lab. But um, I think it's important to be bold and to exercise your needs. So if you have like, you know, a really tight budget and you're producing your film yourself, you know, you can say that to a lab and just say like, I'm on a really tight budget. Like, what can you offer? me and I think that a lot of what budgeting and filmmaking is is um, a negotiation between like yourself um, and other people so learning how to be friendly but firm and to strategize and being creative can really take you pretty far um so what advice do you have about like figuring out how to get your film seen and getting distribution or even like picking festivals um, to try and screen at? It's, it's tough. It, it takes a while. It takes a lot of trust in yourself. I think a lot of things we've talked about, like uh, support of friends and things like that is really helpful. But yeah, it takes a while um, to sort of break through and get your film to play at festivals um, and at the right festivals. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a lot of patience and it's so hard to, so I would say the first thing is that when we're talking about budgets, uh, you're making a short film and who knows how much you're putting into it, but let's say $5,000, make sure you put aside 500 or so for festival submissions. Uh, and I say that just because so often people will put all this work into a short film and then they'll get rejected from five or 10 festivals, which is normal, um, but then stop submitting. And it's just such a shame to sort of uh, not it's 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 so easy to happen though because you get self-conscious of your work and um it's a new environment a new scenario finding an audience that uh it's 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 uh it's tricky uh and then beyond that things like distribution um and i forget there was another part of that question even just theatrical engagements and even just festivals it, it's there's no easy solution there's no distributor that you can sign with that's suddenly gonna get your film at the right festivals it's really if you're working in this sort of spectrum that i think sophia and i have been talking about in the sort of budget range you really have to do everything yourself and i think even at the higher level uh if you really want the right release for your film you have you have to pick a very savvy distributor or on some level, you're still doing it yourself. I mean, an extreme example would be someone like Stanley Kubrick, who would was very active in the releases of his films and where they would play. And we can see that happening right now with COVID and what films are being released and what films aren't being released and different filmmakers uh, trying to find different options that, yeah, from my experience, a few times I've gone with distributors or certain routes and just thinking, okay, uh, the film's reached this level. We played at these festivals. Now I can move on to the next project and this will have a life or we'll do something. And then it just drops off that you, that there's a certain level of, that these films are so small, unique and niche that it takes, that it's something that you kind of have to keep, I find personally have to keep kind of guiding or helping along. Um, so learning about festivals, I mean, I remember I did that a, a lot. And I think that's part of what the MDFF screening series was too, that I'm always watching a lot of films that I wasn't, you know, just watching the big, you know, films that would get a week-long release in Toronto. I was trying to see, like, what was playing at the Berlin Al Forum, what was playing at Director's Fortnite, what was playing the Venice Horizonte, and to sort of see these smaller films and what sort of roots they would get and what sort of lives a smaller film would have and what's the sort of uh, landscape of different festivals that it can play at and different roots and what are, you know, learning about different uh, distributors, you know, catalogs that you like, um, things like that. I think I'm, I'm glad I got to sort of, you know, learn some of those elements. Because I think for me, my stuff, again, is very niche. So sort of learning where my films could exist and the places they could play, I think was was helpful. 
in terms of picking where you want to launch the premiere of your film? And do you, you know, for instance, choosing a distributor or choosing a sales agent? Uh, I personally feel with my stuff, it's very important for me to have some control over that, um, that if we don't have the right world premiere, then the film could disappear. Or if we, if it's sold too early, it'll, yeah, it'll disappear on VOD and it won't have a life. So for someone like me, it's more important that it plays at a lot of festivals rather than, you know, getting a, a pre-sale and it disappearing on VOD after two months. Mm. Yeah, I think I like I can echo uh, what you're saying. Like, I think it's important to know what your film is and what the best like showcase for that film to be is um, and looking at it as an object and being like, are there other similar objects that have been in this festival? And it's about finding programmers also, I think that might identify with your work stylistically. So um, for example, um, a programmer, James Latimer at the Berlinale Forum, I know as someone who identifies with the voice of my work because he's programmed me before. So whenever I make new work, I ask him like, what do you think? Like, who do you think? uh might like to see this film and it's about developing i think relationships um with people who are like-minded with you who admire um your work and staying um in contact with them and i think when you're first starting out it is really really hard i was um quite depressed when i was first making work because i was spending a lot of money on film festival submissions and i was just like getting nowhere with it it was a disaster so what i did was i hosted my own screening at the lightbox um i uh employed a little bit of strategy and i got the polish consulate in toronto to sponsor me because i'm polish and my films had a lot of polish content so i was looking at what my films were and kind of trying to reach out to people who might be interested um, in them and the Polish consulate was interested and they sponsored me and they um, helped me rent the light box and I paid for some of the cost and then I uh, promoted the heck out of the, the screening, um, you know, almost sold it out. Um, but that was the first way that I was able to get buzz about my work, that I was able to get programmers in there, that I was able to get, um, you know, my peers to come and see. Um, my work was through really doing it uh, myself. And if you're really, really struggling, I think that's a really good um, way to do it. There's no shame in it. You can get feedback. Um, you have control over the setting. Um, and also you kind of just like get your, your foot in the door. Um, and I think back to what Kaz is saying, like, if you look on IMDb, you can kind of like look at films that are similar to yours. And there's like a release date uh, link that you can click on and you can look at the whole film festival trajectory of that film so studying that um, and also um, you know seeing if your film is in line with certain festivals yeah. uh, like when I first made Never Eat Alone I couldn't get it programmed for a year and a half um, and it wasn't until it was picked up at VIF um, that it won an award and then my career really started rolling from there and it wouldn't have been the right premiere if it had premiered at TIFF because it's a huge festival it would have gotten lost in there but because it premiered um, at VIF and because it was a smaller festival I got um, the attention the film um, deserved and then six months later Bafisi was in touch with me because they wanted to program a retrospective of my work so again I got like very lucky but it's all about I think like finding that um, audience being relentless you are going to be rejected a lot and that's tough and it's really really hard but I think it's really really about um holding on um, and even if your film doesn't get into a festival it's about I think like going to the festival seeing what they do program um, and nurturing relationships with those programmers um, and the film festival I think community so you're kind of like laying out the foundation um, for your work to be programmed in the future or to better understand you know what does get um, chosen for these kinds of film festivals um, and how you can improve um, as a filmmaker and as an artist. And I think the last thing I'll say is uh, you can save a lot of money too by sometimes just asking, you know, for a fee waiver or like a discount. Um, and I think that also like catching early bird um, deadlines for certain film festivals. So you're not like 
paying 100 euro to the Berlinale at the 11th hour just to um, submit uh, your film. I think these little things are little tactics that you can employ um, that will save you a lot of money in the end. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And especially there's also just such a big difference between features and shorts. Mm. I feel very few short filmmakers watch other shorts or especially have an idea of what a short film festival is programming. So I think if you're worried about spending money, then maybe watch more shorts that are playing at festivals, really get a sense of their programming before submitting because they're so different. They're so like short film festivals are so niche in some ways and really are looking for your film. And then other ones, you know, aren't interested in discovering films. They just want to play the films from Sundance. And I remember I did, I watched a lot of short films. And it's funny that you mentioned Berlin Al. I remember reading the artistic statement of Micah Miohona, the curator of the Berlin Al. And I just, it's just one of those pieces of writing where I'm like, I relate to this so much. And if I, if she doesn't like my film, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll feel so bad. But it was a weird moment of like, I have this feeling about her that she'll like my film and somehow, so we, yeah, you just mentioned like the 100 euro fee. I think we won a prize with Princess Margaret Boulevard that we had a 35 print of it. So instead of submitting, back then you'd submit DVDs, we mailed a 35 print to Micah and then oh, that's wow. uh, how we played at the Berlin Al for the first time. Um, Bold move. It's like they, we got their attention because we sent the 35 millimeter print yeah and they had to like go to a theater and like set up the screening just to watch that short so it just got them to uh best case them. scenario for them to be watching it. yeah it all sort of came together um but yeah that was yeah back in 2007. <laughs> one thing that i forgot to add too is like you know we're talking about bigger film festivals but like don't be snobby like if your film isn't getting into big festivals like that's okay. Like a premiere sometimes at a smaller festival can be good for you. And as much as you can, like go to those film festivals, go there, talk to people, meet people. You never know who will be there. Like the first film festival that I went to was called, you might laugh, it's called the, the Zebra Poetry Film Festival in Berlin. <laughs> and it was a poetry based film festival. Um, and, you know, obviously I had like my site set really high on where the film could um, premiere, but it was the right environment and the right place for me to be screening um, that film. I think it's, it's a learning curve. So putting yourself out there as much as possible, um, I think is really important. Have you guys figured out like an ideal trajectory now for um, any of your films that you've done so far or like what you would wanna do in future? And like, if so, how, like how, what were those considerations for you? Oh, with new films or what, 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 what are we sort of strategizing? Yeah, whether it's new films or something that you felt like, oh, I did the right premiere for this film and why was that the right premiere? Or, or the yeah, right I mean, um, competition is something that's, you know, always kind of on my mind with a premiere. So I mean, that was a big debate with and but we were just so encouraged by the platform competition. Mm. Um, I guess with, Can with Canadians, we always kind of TIFF changes so much too. Um, but that just sort of uh, that gave us a lot. We were sort of excited to premiere at TIFF when you know we got the invitation from Andrea Picard and Cameron Bailey that that was sort of. But yeah, we were we we're all we were thinking: Do we wait for Berlin or other festivals for? Uh, those sort of traditional competition slots. But in terms of trajectory, I think what's on my mind a lot now is now how can I get my film to play theatrically for a week? Um, the main destination being New York. Um, so yeah, we, we I guess I'm still sort of doing these sort of things that I, I was doing as a short filmmaker and, you know, what's the right way to play in New York? What, you know, even just thinking Manhattan, like what are the five theaters there? What do they typically play? looking at what sort of, what do you need to do to earn or get enough audience interest for a, a film to exist in New York uh, for a week um, and then maybe play other American cities. So that's still, yeah, a bit of a, a strategy and the best way to do it is uh, always changing, yeah. Yeah, and I agree with you about, I think like being in competition, I think that's really, really 
important. Um, and I mean, not that this is everything, but kind of like looking at like what the prize money is for that competition. So if you're being offered like a few premieres, you kind of like want to see, I guess, like what you're going to get, I think like visibility wise, like how the film will grow, but also just like looking at like what the prizes are, because if you have like a one in eight chance of winning like 10,000 euro, that's not, that's not bad. And I mean, it's never guaranteed, but I think it's about strategy um, and thinking about, um, you know, how you can make a little bit of money, how your film can um, thrive, how your film can get, um, I think the best impact possible. And for me, it's about like looking at like the calendar year of like top tier festivals and knowing when those deadlines are going to be. A big lesson that I've learned is you don't wanna just like finish a film for a film festival deadline. Um, as I've said before, like a film is like a living, breathing object. You don't want to like force it into this box really early because programmers watch like a ton of films all the time. And I think that like, unless like you're, you know, P.T. Anderson or Claire Denis, like you really need to kind of like make sure that your film is ready um, and it's in the best shape and best form possible for that programmer. Um, to be watching it. Like I have a friend who's a programmer for TIFF and she watches like six screeners a day. The competition is really high. It's really tough. A lot of people want to make films and share them. Um, so you wanna make sure that they're ready for that um, submission. So I think just like mapping out, you know, like when Venice is, when Cannes is, when Berlin is, when TIFF is, and then looking at the second tier and then kind of like making that um, map for yourself and knowing what that, um, trajectory is has always been really important and then after having your film screen in festivals for a year as Kaz was saying that's when you want to kind of focus on having um, a theatrical because that makes you eligible for awards and more um, press and something to consider as well when you're screening at festivals is maybe you want to review uh, keep your reviews to capsule size so that when you have your theatrical you have like more comprehensive um, reviews that are coming out um, about uh, your work. But I think in terms of, yeah, release, it's like a mixture of like strategy, looking at what's happened at these festivals um, in uh, the past and just kind of thinking of ways that like might be, um, I guess, places that are best for your film um, and for yourself as an artist, um, I think, to thrive in. Yeah, just to build on what Sophia said, uh, with my first feature, we raced to get it ready for Berlin, and then Berlin didn't take it, and then we got into Locarno, and then with my Not second bad. feature, and then, we, and then with with Hammer, we rushed to get it ready for Locarno, and then Locarno didn't take it, and then it played at Berlin. So the opposite, or it just you never know what's going to happen. But in both cases, we kind of rushed the cut to thinking like this is the only festival that's going to take it, or the, like we got a relationship with them, and then they passed on it, and then a different. So I, I think, I don't know what, I, what advice I'm trying to give with that. I think the main thing is just being realistic and having a, multiple plans and like a backup plan. And so, and slowly learning um, and adjusting. Um, but yeah, that would be the underlying is that it could be, it, it, it's never easy to find the right home, but it's a very big decision and sort of having uh, multiple approaches or strategies and ways of thinking about it. It's always a good idea. I think what works for you is that you're not um, entitled. And I think that's the thing is like, just because you've screened at a film festival before, they don't owe you one the next time. You might have a relationship with them, but they're not like contractually bound to screen your work again. And I think that it's important when you're rejected, sometimes it can really hurt and you might feel really passionately about your film, but you know, giving a programmer, you know, many reasons why your film should have been programmed is a terrible idea. I think that yeah. being, I know, I know it might sound ridiculous. I feel ridiculous saying it out loud, but I know there are filmmakers out there who have done it and it has not served them well. Preserve your relationship with the festival. When um, they said that it was really hard, like believe them and know that your film will find um, new life somewhere else. And I think that if you submit expecting nothing, you will always be pleasantly surprised um, with the results. Um. 
well, we're, I guess we're, we've gone over a bit. So I, one last question is just, um, well, this was really great. So I hope that was okay with you guys, but it, I thought that what you had to say was really, really <laughs> helpful. So um, what are you guys working on at the moment? Hmm. I'm, so I'm working on a new feature film called uh, A Portrait. And it's a film that I'm collaborating on uh, with Dara. And um, it's about my grandfather's uh, violin mentor named Kathleen Parlow, who was a great Canadian violinist at the beginning of the 20th century. It was kind of erased in Canadian history. So she did tests with Thomas Edison and it had a 100 page concerto dedicated to her at the age of 17. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, her legacy has kind of just evaporated. So um, Dara and I have been doing research for the last three years um, on this woman, and we've been writing a screenplay um, to kind of tell this woman's history in tandem with uh, a continued journey of Audrey Benack, this character that Dara and I have developed together and um, the film was workshopped at the Feed Lab in July at Feed Marseille and um, Dan and Kaz at MDFF have been um, collaborating and supporting the project as well and it picked up a little prize. So it's been, it's in development right now um, and we're hoping to shoot next year, fingers crossed, depending on what happens in the world with COVID and funding um, and such, it's a little bit of an unsure place so we're giving ourselves a lot of time um, to move forward with the film yeah um i like sophia also am hoping to work with dara campbell again <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i'm uh dara yeah. campbell fan club yeah so i'm <laughs> yeah uh developing something uh for dara and matt too uh new project uh where hopefully we can, i can work with those two again um, but yeah, we're at, we're out of time. Is that the, uh, I'm just looking at the, the participants, uh, if they have any other questions or I'm almost just curious if I see a name, Cindy Silver, is that, that's not Nathan Silver's mother, is it? That would be amazing if it was. <laughs> I've always wanted to meet her. She's an extraordinary woman. Yeah, she's a great actress. Well, there, if you guys are up for it, there's one other question I see that, um, I think would be really great to answer. Um, which is oh, um, oh. <laughs> I'll let you talk. Hello, hello. It's Cindy Silver. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Hi. know if I can get my picture on. I got. Oh yes, I can. Girl. Just give me a second, and I'll we'll okay. let. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to. If you <laughs> just turn your camera on, we'll get you. Okay, start video. Amazing. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Would nice you like see. some seltzer? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. That's this was great. great. I, 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 to be honest, I thought of Nathan and you during one of the earlier questions where it was sort of being resourceful and shooting on location. I thought of right. Exit Elena, which was shot in your house. And I remember- Well, and, and so was Uncertain Terms. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're on location here. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. And Harvey, who helped with all the films. And uh, he's, he, in Exit Elena, he was the practice patient. So cool. Yeah, this is great. We had yeah. Dara here for Thanksgiving. I made turkey and she's a vegetarian. So, yeah, another oh, collaborator, wow. Dara Campbell's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We love her and Hannah Gross and everyone. Amazing. So yeah. when can I see this movie that my son executive produced? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Nathan's one of the producers on 15,000 feet. Um, hopefully when movie theaters open in New York, we'll be, uh, have a screening. I mean, we're hoping late fall, but it might be the new year, but. Oh, I hope so. Well, we crossed. moved here because of my son. His movie played, you know, in the Woodstock Film Festival. Oh, Woodstock, yeah. yeah. And we, yeah, he was an alternate. And then he won the first ultra indie award for um, Uncertain Terms. Oh, wow. There and I know. was on stage with Jennifer Connolly and um, Natalie Portman and Darren Yarnowski. And the star of Exit Elena, my husband, Jim Chiros, was in all of his um, student films. And then he didn't use him for pie. 
<laughs> so Exit Elena, Jim should have been very famous, but he was in all of Nathan's short films and Exit Elena. So cool. He played my husband. Yeah. yeah. But I love seeing Tally Medell and Hannah Gross and yeah, all doing everyone so from yeah. the movies. Yeah. India yeah. Menwes, who's Bobby and Carl. Yeah. They were all, yeah. Uh, I know, love all of you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this yes. is so, so great. I'm glad I asked. Is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm so <laughs> glad you popped in to say yeah. hello. Oh, I love listening to this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. I can't wait to see the movie. I'm going to watch all your others. I've been watching all of Frank Mosley's and all of um, Joss Jensen's and uh, Theodore Belukas, who is in Nathan's films, is oh, right. I'm watching yeah, him. Yeah. And give well, me a list. <laughs> how amazing! Yeah. yeah, we had Frank Mosley on here too. So right, yeah, he's yeah, great. Another uh, yeah, guest. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I loved what you said about getting your name out. You know, Nathan was a very shy kid. And then once he made films and went all over the world, meeting everyone in the film industry, yeah. that opened all the doors. Yeah, Nathan and I met on the film circuit. And he was one of the, yeah, again, when we're talking about MDFF and like our early screenings, Nathan and I met in Vienna at the Viennale. I oh, love that, yeah. That's where we met Dan Salik too. So it was sort of meeting at festivals and sort of, yeah, Nathan and I, you know. Were so did I meet you there? Because I was there, you know, with Hans. It was the year of Exit Elena. Elena, yeah. Elena, sorry, yeah. No problem. Let me ask Harvey, were we there for Exit? No, we were, for no, we were there with uncertain terms. Right. And same. then I was there a couple of times and um, yeah, Hans was wonderful. That was a terrible loss. Um, mm. But oh, that's right, so right. great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful to see all of you still working. And, you know, <laughs> Nathan's working on a lot of things. And, yes. and, and it, 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 it'll come back. It has to. It, it, my son is in the music industry, my older son. And, you know, right before the lockdown, he had an amazing success with dubstep artists and 40,000 kids at a concert. Now they have to do drive-ins, but it'll come back. It'll all come back. It will, fingers crossed. Yeah, well, I'm so glad to have met you guys and yeah. listened to you. It was great to meet you. It was yeah. so and nice I'm to watch you all your films. <laughs> all right, love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That was great. I'm so glad you said that, Cass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Virtually, we've been on the set of Uncertain Terms and Maison de Bonheur during this uh, <laughs> that's world true. crossing. Yeah. That's true. I was, I'll show everyone before we go. But I'm in Julianne's home, and Julianne is the astrologer that I shot Maison du Bonheur with, and I'm staying in her home, and I'm doing this Q&A from her astrology table, and this is one of her astrology. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah. having us. Yeah, this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And thanks, everyone, for all the questions. I suppose we got all of them. It's sort of uh, there's one more if you're up for oh, it. There is. Sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, so um, this person asks, um, how life, how does life separate from filmmaking? Can that aid or hinder a filmmaker's life? And when did your lives become more in line with your conception of a filmmaker's life, if at all? Oh, wow. That's, um, what a heavy question. <laughs> Great question. Um, um, I think, it's obviously a very complicated thing to answer, but yeah, it's nice when they in, intertwine in healthy ways. Um, <laughs> and I always kind of look look for that or look for ways of bringing my life into films. So I'm quite proud of Anna 13,000 Feet that like my mom acts in it and that we were able to shoot at that daycare where I went to that daycare as a child and like all those sort of bringing those elements into my life and sort of revisiting places or exploring places. Um, and then inversely, yeah, things like our MDFF screening series or meeting people like Cindy Silver or Nathan Silver or friendships that you get through being a filmmaker, sort of traveling the world 
encountering different cities. I think a lot of a lot of my friends now are filmmakers or it's a big part of my social life, uh, which I think has helped me a lot through making films. It sort of helped me nurture different relationships. But at the same time, yeah, it can, um, it's a daunting path in a lot of ways, or it can be very, it can take a toll uh, making films. Um, so there's the temptation to sort of romanticize it, but at the same time, I think also just sort of looking after yourself and um, not pushing things too far um, at the same time. So it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of, bit of everything that there's definitely, and I, I think, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, hard to answer. What, what's your, what are your thoughts, Sophia? It's fancy for work. It is a hard question to answer. It's a deep one. Um, yeah. And I think that like taking care of yourself is really, really important. Like even things like exercise and making sure that that's incorporated into your life, really, really important might sound like very basic, but I know that like Kaz goes on like really long runs. I like to do Pilates, but just making sure that you're taking care of yourself. And I know it might sound basic and this isn't like a health and nutrition course, but filmmaking is very consuming. It demands a lot um, of your time, your money, um, your social energy. Um, for me, it's a practice that's all consuming, but it's because it's like, I, I don't know how to do um, anything else. It's really, really important to me. Um, so I think that in terms of, I guess, like balancing life and incorporating life into your filmmaking practice, it's about creating like healthy boundaries with yourself, um, but also other people and knowing sometimes that you're gonna cross them sometimes. You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna forget people's birthdays. You're gonna take it too far. You might max out a credit card, but it's all about, I think, like reining yourself in and like pushing your limits, um, you know, and letting yourself fail. I think that's really, really important, but also kind of like admitting to it and taking responsibility um, and learning from it. Um, and for me, I think a big therapeutic part of my filmmaking practice, and I hope I'm not wrong in assuming um, that Kaz might feel the same way, but I like to, I think like process a lot of the experiences that I've had in my life through filmmaking. So there's a lot, I think in life that's really hard to grasp or to understand or even to articulate or things that I myself don't understand as a person. But I find that through, I think exploring um, these topics and using filmmaking as a vehicle, it helps me grasp and understand something that's happened to me. So for example, I have a new short film that's coming out called Point in Line to Plane, which is about um, my first producer passing away um, very suddenly, a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, and for me, like health-wise, mental health-wise, it was a tough film for me to make because I was grieving this loss, but also the energy with which I made this film was I think, um, very special and unique um, and the energy that I put into it during this like very delicate of my uh, period of my time sorry period of my life kind of made the film what it was but I constantly had to kind of like check in with myself and make sure that I was taking care of myself so I think it's about like knowing yourself knowing your limits being vulnerable giving as much as you can but also I think checking in with yourself throughout the process. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I totally relate to that. And yeah, I, I think a lot of my films have been sort of forms of uh, self-therapy or ways of processing things. But I, I suppose something, again, I think I've had the tendency to almost over-romanticize some of those ideas. So something I've learned um, personally the past few years is films are good as sort of self-therapy but then also just normal therapy is good too. <laughs> and yeah, then like, therapy is films good. can help inform actual uh, therapy uh, that they still get to see a therapist. Um, and then also just talking about intertwining uh, life and filmmaking. Uh, one, one of my favorite books on filmmaking is um, Cassavetes on Cassavetes. And it's almost a biography of Cassavetes and sort of goes into depths about how his life intertwined with his films. And yeah, so that's way better probably advice than I could give, but yeah, I highly recommend um, that book. 
Um, that's definitely something I've returned to for inspiration, uh, especially when I was in undergrad a lot. Um, that's sort of how, how life can inform a film and ways to sort of navigate the two. I haven't read it. I'm going to check it out. It's like a stick. It's like a Bible. It's so thorough. It's a great, it's Ray Carney. It's so, it's intense, but it's, it's amazing. Okay. I'm going to check it out. I have a quick practical question for you guys, which is you're talking a lot about how it's important to know what different festivals screen, both shorts and features, that I know a lot of those films are hard to find. So how do you guys watch those? Well, I mean, most shorts do make their way online. Um, mm. if not, there's normally like a grace period of a year, but um, yeah, I think pretty quickly you could, um, if you go back a year or two, you know, find one or two sort of magic shorts from the past five years that are like that filmmaker is making you know, the type of film that I'm making, where, where does that exist? And you just sort of, again, find these amazing, some small festivals are way better than bigger festivals. Um, especially, yeah, like the US, uh, like the Maryland Film Festival is like incredible. But I think I found out about that festival by just because they were programming filmmakers I like. And you sort of learn the nuance of it. Like why it's such an amazing festival because like all the New York filmmakers like go down there for a weekend and they only screen films uh, by filmmakers who attend. You have to attend to screen there. So when you go there, you meet all these people and it's just kind of magic. And there's a lot of little festivals like that, but it's, you know, it takes a while to sort of learn the landscape and the niches and where things play. Um, and there's a lot of sort of festivals that are sort of higher profile, but I don't know if they'd be worth attending um, or if there'd be much of a experience or it might be, who knows, maybe the festival takes a month and there's only one or two screens a day and there aren't many people. You know, there's so many things that would sort of um, guide your decision. But yeah, there's just so many cool short film festivals and there's so many like great programmers that really do want to discover films. So it's, um, learning that landscape and it's like this weird thing where short programmers in a lot of ways are like short filmmakers um that you know they're trying to find their way in so yeah. uh, like sophia kind of alluded to sort of emailing or sort of asking for a fee waiver like i think if you can kind of identify uh the short programmers that really care and are doing interesting programming and then that you know interesting programming aligns with the film that you made um, you know, sort of say, I love these films you've programmed. I think you might like my film. I think you would get a response is what I, you know, that if people like in those sort of worlds connect, they, they sort of appreciate it. That I, I'm sure they get a lot of people just asking for a fee waiver, but very few sort of with like a thoughtful sort of email that sort of understands their programming. Um, yeah, complimenting them on the programming is really, really important. And saying like not just like because like you know not like an empty vapid compliment but like if you genuinely like the program like for yeah. example a big fan of Andrea Picard's like shorts wavelength program um at TIFF you know like showing your receipts and showing that you actually really care and that you're doing your homework and that you're invested in the film festival community I think matters and keeping those emails short and succinct really, really important as well, because again, they get a lot of emails. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're getting to the point, I think, as um, cleanly and as quickly um, as you can. Um, but in terms of watching those films, um, yeah, you can write to the programmer and just say, um, you know, I'm a fan of your program or like, I'd like to discover your program. Are there links to these shorts that I could get? Also getting a membership to, I feel like I'm advertising, but it's just the truth, but Festival Scope can also help because a lot of filmmakers put their work up online on Festival Scope. And if you're a paying member, it's a lot of films that you can access on there. Um, and also just writing to the filmmakers as well. Like I have a lot of people that write to me asking for links. Some filmmakers, um, like it's a very personal thing. Some filmmakers don't like to share links to their films, especially when they're new and fresh. It's a little bit of a faux pas when uh, a filmmaker has a film out at a festival and it's very, very new. Um, it's, it's not great to ask for a link. Um, it depends on what the reason is, but maybe about six months later, they might kind of like loosen up and be more willing to share a link. Um, but I think, again, um, it's, uh, it's a very personal thing and it depends on, I think, filmmaker to filmmaker. Yeah, and a thing, I, another way of thinking about it, now that we're actually talking about like corresponding with programmers and things like that, a memory I had um, 
with my uh, when I was with my first short is we submitted to TIFF and we didn't get in uh, with my first short Assault. But then when we submitted my my next short film, Princess Margaret Boulevard, and they accepted it. And when I finally met them, they're like, they told me how much they liked my first short mm -hmm. that they weren't able to program. And that seeing that they almost programmed it, but they didn't. But then that sort of informed their decision to take my next short which I think is sort of a healthy way of looking at it or thinking it's not always just re rejection that there are so many spots, especially with short films, it's so strategic too, that there are programs of shorts and it's the right balance between different shorts. It's not just, you are a filmmaker, you are not a filmmaker. Like it's, um, you know, it's uh, something that's negotiated and there's many difficult decisions that have to be made. Um, so that's, I think, a good way to think about it. And, in terms of sort of healthy relationships with programmers and sort of, you know, it, and if they might hate one of your films and then love the next one, and that's that's normal. And that's how people react to films, you know, that it's, it it's, all, it's all good. <laughs> and like with short film programs, it's like you were saying, Kaz, it is very much like editing a film. It's curation. I think programming, um, as you were alluding to, is an art in and of itself. And it's kind of like, if your film doesn't get programmed, it's kind of like, footage that didn't make it into your film. Just because it didn't make it in, it didn't doesn't mean that it's like terrible. It just means that it wasn't a right fit. So I think orienting yourself in terms of like being like, oh, you know, my film didn't get in. Um, um, it's not because like your film is terrible. It's just because it just wasn't the right tone in terms of what the program is supposed to be um, thematically because programmers are looking at different shorts and they sometimes choose, I think, programs like on theme or like in terms of like dramatic structure. Um, and I think sometimes with some festivals, like 5% of what's submitted is programmed. So it's about reminding yourself about these things and also reminding yourself that it's very um, competitive, but it's about building your base of work so that programmers know what your voice is. They know um, uh, how, I guess, like distinctive it is and they understand, um, you know, how this piece fits into the whole. Um, and for me, my approach anyway, is just to kind of like keep making work and like keep throwing like eggs at walls until something really sticks. Does that mean that you should submit your short somewhere even if you're like oh this is a long shot there's no way they're going to program me because like maybe then at least they know who you are so the next time you have a so even and even if they were so, yeah you, then so for instance if you're a filmmaker time. based in toronto in toronto is a good you know maybe one of those festivals uh, where you would pay special attention to or would want to you know like you sort of and then around the world too you know like if you make films like Sophie and I do, then you'd probably pay special attention to the Berlin Al Forum or Locarno or places like that more than other festivals that you would sort of nurture certain places. Uh, Canada in particular, yeah, you always submit to TIFF and then it works out kind of great that there's TIFF and then there's Nouveau Cinema, Montreal, um, all the other festivals happen after TIFF. So that's also another way I sort of strategize if there's sort of the A-list or like the big festival and then the other ones, and you kind of do it regionally too, um, Europe or worldwide, different sort of premier status. But yeah, you sort of, I think it's, you, you know, you always want to sort of hope for the best or the, the bigger festival, uh, you know, submit to Cannes first and then, but then have a solid, you know, three months later, where do we start submitting to? And then if we don't get into those festivals, then where do we start submitting? Like have it uh, a roadmap sort of planned out because again, three months later is tough. It's hard to pick yourself up every three months. So the more you can kind of plan out the year or have a, you know, sort of what I said earlier is like, we're gonna invest at least $100 or $500 into festival submissions. I remember when I, again, when I was starting out, we would literally, cause you'd mail the DVDs that we would just, okay, we're gonna burn 50 DVDs. We have 50 envelopes. What are the 50 addresses we're gonna write? And we would That's just- That's impressive, 50? Wow. Damn. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of the number floating around uh, back then, back in the day. I remember there would be like a lot of distribution companies for shorts and they would say, we'll submit your film to 50 festivals. But mm -hmm. I think if you read those sort of self-help short filmmaker books and things like that, that's sort of the number that they try to get film students comfortable with that, you know, submit to 30 or 50 festivals. And if you get into one really good one, it's that's that's that is considered a success, you know. 
no one bats a uh, thousand. Totally. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. And I think sometimes it's also about like haggling. So this is like a, a funny example, but I guess like in December, there's like slam dance um, in January, beginning February, there's Rotterdam and then there's the Berlin Alley. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't just like submit to one festival hoping that you would hit big. You submit to all three and you submit early. Um, and then you try to see like maybe if there's like interest for the film. So you could like, let's just say you submitted to Slam Dance and there is a programmer who is interested, um, but they're not sure if they can program you yet because it's too early to lock your program, their program. So then you would write to Rotterdam and the Berlinale and say like, hey guys, just so you know, I submitted this to Slam Dance as well. Um, you know, I would prefer my premiere to go to you. It depends on like where you want to premiere. But I just wanted to let you know that, you know, there's interest. So then um, they know that there's someone kind of like eager for your film. So it puts a little bit more pressure um, on them and it makes the film like look like there's a little bit of interest. So it's always this like haggling and, and back and forth. And in my experience, it's really helped just to kind of like be direct and to be communicative um, and transparent with other film festivals in terms of like the interest that's there um, and kind of keeping them posted and updated and having this kind of like conversation. Um, because for example, if, um, Rotterdam doesn't know that like slam dance or maybe Sundance is interested, then maybe they're not going to think that there's like buzz or interest, but it's about creating that conversation and kind of like trying to like get it going um, early. And it's not about like putting all of your eggs in one basket. It's like, as Kaz said, you know, it's about burning 50 DVDs and kind of like being in touch with people and being like, Hey, like, what do you think? you know, could this work for your festival? And then disseminating uh, that to other festivals and being like, there's interest here. Um, where are you at in terms of your program? Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, communication and then also following up. And um, yeah, um, I remember Denny Cote saying that to me, that it's like his job as a filmmaker, you know? I, I get the email of the programmer, I say, I've made a new film. Do you want to consider it? And then they can say no. And then I, it, the, he has like a very matter of fact way of, of uh, rationalizing it, you know, that, you know, give them the option and then, and then just move on. But that there's like a level of communication and just sort of um, that's sort of expected. Yeah. I think it's a delicate song and dance. Like you don't want to be too pushy, but you want to be, I think, um, straightforward, um, I think as well, I think that's really important. And, you know, I think in my experience and I'm sure you would agree, but I think email submission. So if you have a direct line to a programmer, it's always better to submit the film with the programmer than officially through the festival where it could get lost in submissions. However, if you don't have that opportunity, um, it doesn't mean that your film isn't going to get um, looked at if you're submitting cold, I've had actually um, a lot of um, success or a few successes rather by submitting uh, my film cold to um, film festivals that has indeed worked um, for me. So I think it's just about being relentless and not giving up. It's about burning the 50 DVDs and sending mm -hmm. them out, but we don't deal with DVDs anymore. We're in link currency now. Vimeo links, yeah. Indeed. All right, well, thank you guys so much. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, yeah. um, next week, if um, you can tune into Lockdown Film School, we'll be joined by four um, guests, which will wow. be first for us. Um, so it's two pairs of collaborators. We've got the co-directors, co-writers of The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. So that's Kathleen Hepburn and Elmaya Tailfeathers. And then we also have the co-writers and co-stars of Mouthpiece, Amy Nosbachen and Nora Sadaba. Um, so you can find out more about that session at lockdownfilmschool.com. Um, and thank you so much, Sophia and Kaz, for all of these amazing insights and for sticking around to answer these questions. So thank mm, you so much. Thank you. Thank you for facilitating this conversation. Yeah. Always great to see you, Kaz. Tell everyone in Toronto I say hello. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of fun. Um, Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.